You just saw three excerpts from contemporary compositions using the recorded sounds of an ancient Chinese set of bronze bells in the collection of the Arthur M. Sackler Gallery here at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Asian Art. I'm Keith Wilson, curator of ancient Chinese art at the museum. Welcome to this edition of Look and Listen, our monthly online exploration of the intersections of Asian art and music. I'm delighted you're watching. In this episode, we'll be looking at how contemporary composers gave ancient instruments a contemporary voice, how they sought ways to visualize their sound and exploited digital methods to create their compositions with those sounds. All of these subjects have been inspired by a set of six ancient Chinese bronze bells in the museum's collection. The bells are shown here, suspended from a modern support that loosely resembles the ancient wooden stand that originally held them. Made over 2,500 years ago, the bells range from 10 to 18 inches in height and weigh between six and a half and 24 pounds. The combined weight of the set is nearly 100 pounds, which is a lot of bronze. When researchers compare the number of bells in our set with other sets found by Chinese archaeologists, they conclude that ours is probably incomplete, missing a few of its larger members. Originally, it may have had 10 or 12 bells in total. Our incomplete set and dozens of other extraordinary bells in the museum's collections are featured in a special exhibition at the Arthur M. Sackler Gallery called Resound, Ancient Bells of China. The show illustrates the complex evolution of these bells and the context in which they were used from about 1500 BCE to about 200 BCE, almost the entire span of the Chinese Bronze Age. It's organized chronologically, with our sixth bell set displayed near the end, illustrating a time when bells were used melodically in musical ensembles that included other kinds of instruments. This was a classical period of music in China, when numerous regional courts spread across China, supported orchestras and music bureaus. We wanted to bring these ancient bells to life in the show, so I worked with the exhibition team to host a competition for composers to create new pieces of music utilizing the audio recordings we had of our six bell set. We also challenged the composers to illustrate their compositions with videos that visually express the nature of their music. We issued a wide call for proposals and short samples, ultimately receiving dozens of submissions. These were evaluated in a blind process, so we didn't know the names of the composers. In the end, the jury selected three winners, who went on to create the music video compositions that can now be experienced in the exhibition and on the exhibition's web pages. Those three winners will be joining me in this edition of Look and Listen. The three composers are Doug Van Noort, an artist, researcher, composer, and improviser at York University in Toronto, Canada. Norman Lowry, Professor Emeritus of Music at Drew University in New Jersey, who now lives in upstate New York. Last is Hugh Livingston, a cellist and composer living in Oakland, California. They will be sharing their inspiration and the techniques they used in making their beautiful video illustrated compositions. At the same time, I'll address some related ideas from ancient Chinese material culture and music history. Let's start with Doug Van Noort and his piece called Striking Resemblance. When first listening to the composition, it seemed to explore the notion of resonance, the generation of sound through waves produced by vibrating metal, which in turn brought to my mind the special acoustic properties of Chinese bells and the way they're played. Western bells, 
such as the Liberty Bell hanging in Independence Hall in Philadelphia, have a round cross section and a circular mouth when you look at them from below. Chinese bells, on the other hand, have a somewhat flattened shape and an oval cross section pointed at either end when you look at it from below. The broad arc of the bell's two faces meet at two sharply angled corners. You can see these characteristics on this bell in the Sackler collection. You can also see that the bell has a solid shaft that extends upward from the main part of the bell. On the side of this shaft is a ring that allows the bell to be hung from a rack, as we saw with the Sackler set. You can also see the elaborate surface decoration, which includes rows of raised knobs on both sides of the bell. The peculiar shape of the Chinese bell appears with the earliest examples and continues throughout the Bronze Age. Not simply an artistic choice, this design enables each bell to potentially produce two different notes if struck at two different points on the exterior. This diagram illustrates where such a bell must be struck to produce each of the two notes. The center on the front of the bell and to one side. This quality makes Chinese bells very efficient. Chinese sets need half as many bells since each one can produce two notes. Therefore, the six bells in the Sackler set can actually produce 12 notes. The largest set of bells yet discovered with 65 bells can produce more than 100 notes. Here is a facsimile of that set being demonstrated at the Hubei Provincial Museum in China. Ancient Chinese bells must have been played by experienced musicians able to aim their wooden rods or mallets at precise strike zones on the exterior. Now, let's hear Doug Van Noort, our first composer, who will speak about his composition, Striking Resemblance. Thank you, Keith, for setting the stage with that rich background on the acoustics of these amazing bells. It was an absolute pleasure to work with the bell recordings in composing a soundscape for the Resound exhibition. The project resonated with me along several dimensions. For one, I am interested in musical practices of different cultures, and in particular how sonic and compositional value systems of a given culture and a given era become frozen and materialized in the form of musical instruments. I'm also very interested in the ways that sounds self-organize around conceptual categories of music and noise and how their function and context help to construct this. The exhibition does a beautiful job of demonstrating this in the case of these ancient Chinese bells. Finally, I love to work with digital recordings of sonorous, unique, and compelling sounds, to improvise with their inner qualities, to sculpt and possibly radically reshape them, allowing a work to emerge from this conversation. This is very much my process as an electroacoustic composer and improviser, and was no different in this case. I feel that digital sound objects can offer a glimpse into the essence of the subject of their recording. In the case of natural environments, this may be the emergent structures of many self-adapting organisms. In the case of these bells, I think it is the now ancient evolution of their function and a sonic value system that invokes their time and place. I also think it is amazing that these recordings came from the, one of the very last strikings of these bells from decades ago which to me adds more intrigue to their value as a kind of archival and spectral resonance of their formal life. Because I wanted to work with the essence of the recordings, I actually did not want to know anything about these bells or their history until after my piece was made. For the same reason, I did not want to think about the visuals until after the fact. Instead, I listened repeatedly to these recordings to meditate on their sonic properties in a way that composer and scholar Pierre Schaeffer might have called reduced listening. This allowed me to internalize their spectral and temporal qualities, their varying roughness or smoothness, their harmonics, noise content, attack, and temporal envelope. For me, this is a kind of embodied learning process that is then consciously forgotten in the act of creation. 
I then imported the bell recordings into my digital instrumental performance system, which I call the Granular Feedback Expanded Instrument System, or GRACE. It is based around a practice I refer to as manual sculpting of digital sound files, or sometimes as multidimensional turntablism. Using methods well known in the field of computer music, such as granular synthesis and spectral resynthesis, I take apart sound files, drawing out their harmonics, noise content, attack, and so on, and relayer, loop, scrub, and juxtapose these elements in an improvised and real time fashion. In this process, pitch material comes both from the fundamental frequency of a given bell, as well as its most prominent overtones, which were selectively articulated. The manual scrubbing actions are done using a Wacom tablet and stylus, allowing me to strike these digital bells at varying speeds and non-linearly access different parts of their timeline, accessing the different pitches of each recording with varying levels of transformation. In this way, there is always a semblance of the original bell sound and of their essence, but it is reformed and reimagined through these digital strikes, hence the name of my piece, Striking Resemblance, or Striking Resemblance. Each of these scrubbing actions may be looped, altered in time and frequency, suspended, stored, and returned at a later point. At any given time, there may be many layers of transformed bell scrubbing actions in play, or sometimes just a single line. This real-time composition process is always my first step in composing a soundscape. From there, I then take the session into a digital audio workstation, Pro Tools in particular, and juxtapose these different moments into a new reality. In the resultant piece, the first half builds to a driving rhythmic pulse that features the onset attack of the bells, before a transition at the halfway point to more suspended harmonic qualities that emerge from the bell strikes, and rhythmic loops that are more airy and sparse. Once the piece was created, I invited video artist Alicia Poirier of Montreal to create a visualization that was driven by the sound of my composition, and which would act as a kind of abstract spectrogram, representing the acoustic and material qualities of the bells. Given the museum context, I thought it would be good to create an ambient and minimalist soundscape composition that allowed for nonlinear experiences of the work from a potentially high volume of gallery visitors, who would hopefully remain for the full five and a half minutes and beyond, but who could at least have a satisfying transitory experience for moments if they intended to keep uh, moving through. By strongly focusing on the spectral and acoustic qualities of the bells as compositional elements, my hope has been that the work would engender a contemplative and meditative experience of the bells themselves for many people over the life of the exhibition. Thank you.
Thank you, Doug, for your really moving, evocative composition. Now, I'd like to turn to our second composer, Norman Lowry, and his piece titled River of Bells, which combines raw bell tones with sounds recorded in nature, chiefly those produced by a flowing stream near Norman's former home in northern New Jersey. The pace, power, and volume of the music is directly linked to this natural inspiration. The stream is also the primary subject of the video. This lively, syncopated work, as well as Norman's lifelong interest in animism, made me think of the close connection between ancient bells and nature in South China, especially among the cultures that existed along the Yangtze River. Although they are not as well documented archaeologically as those of the North, they also had the ability to cast incredibly sophisticated bronze objects, including bells. Many researchers believe that the bells made by these cultures may have had an animistic function and were possibly used in rituals set in natural settings. Their arguments are based on the form of early Bronze Age bells unearthed in South China and the circumstances surrounding their burial. Let's look at one early type. This bell is a large one, measuring two and a half feet in height and weighing over 200 pounds. It lacks a suspension ring, but the shaft is hollow so that it can be mounted with its mount facing upwards. Monumental bells like this have only been found singly without other bells or burial objects and in informal burial pits, not elaborate tombs, and only in Southern China. With a burial like this, it is unclear who owned the bell and how it may have been used. These large bells are much too heavy to have been handheld and may have functioned more percussively, like a gong, in ritual ceremonies performed outdoors. In this usage, they remind me of much later temple bells, typically encountered at religious sites situated deep in the mountains, so as to be enveloped by nature. A close connection between bells and nature can be seen in another early type that has also been found only in southern China. Each of these bells is designed to hang from a loop on its flat top. Although it's hard to see in this image, they have the same pointed oval cross section when viewed from below as all the other bells. Here, the angled corners are emphasized by tigers and birds that are boldly asserting a connection with a natural world. Despite these striking designs, however, we don't really know how these bells were used. They too are typically found alone in burial pits, not tombs, so there's little archeological context to help our understanding. Over time, these early Southern forms and practices disappeared, replaced by the increasingly popular musical sets with bells suspended from wooden racks like our six bell set. This detour into the natural associations of very early bells in Southern China and their possible animistic uses seems an apt way to introduce Norman Lowry and his River of Bells. Let's hear how he incorporated an animistic philosophy into his unique music video creation. What a joy and honor it was to have the opportunity to make use of these amazing 2,500-year-old bells in my work. They provided me with a means of making connection with not only an ancient history, but with another culture and in their incorporation into my work offered a 
continuation of what I've been interested in for years in relation to the work that I've done not only as a classically trained composer but particularly in the discovery that I made of conjoining sound making devices with masks into what I refer to as singing masks and in the work that I've done with those masks over the years I have come to label myself an animist. I believe that everything is infused with spirit. There is intelligence at the heart of all matter. Human intelligence is just one peculiar manifestation of this larger ground of being. Other manifestations are radically different, incomprehensible to conventional human sensibilities. Yet all things give voice to the underlying, cohering essence, the spirit swirling through cells, molecules, atoms, quarks, and superstrings. If we listen carefully, we can resonate along with those primary vibrations and receive information, knowledge, altered understanding. This has been the thrust of the teaching by the singing masks that I have been making and employing in ceremonial performances over the past 30 years or so. Their voices and iconographic presences have been continual reminders of connection with that animistic sense of spirit essence in rivers, rocks, sky, trees, as well as among all things animate. They have become guides in all my work into shifting perspectives, into experiencing everything as holy, into mythic and oniric reality. For me, animism is a lifelong practice, similar to the composer Pauline Oliveros's deep listening. It entails the attempt to closely observe without judgment. Now, that may be the hardest thing of all to do. Without labels, without prejudice, to attempt to experience the reality of things. And the goal then is to understand how everything, absolutely everything, is interconnected. How we are all, uh, in a sense, to use the expression, one. Uh, I put it sometimes in terms of my perspective as a musician, to hear, to listen to everything sing. Everything has a unique voice. I have an interest in the convergence of the primal and the present, in the sacred and the mundane. The actual creation of the piece was pretty straightforward and even, in a sense, simple. I first made some close-up video clips of a local brook, not really a river, but nicely flowing and having a little waterfall. Then some editing, altering the direction of flow and juxtaposing the stream with waterfall. By chance, I had just installed an app on my iPad that allowed me to play the samples of the bells, both individually and via a keyboard in looping patterns. I actually improvised playing the app as I viewed the video, attempting to merge the bells with the water's swirls and flows. Thus, River of Bells.
Thank you, Norman, for your engaging composition. Now, I'd like to turn to our final composer, Hugh Livingston, who was the only one to include an additional instrument in his piece. The richly layered combination of bells and piano in this composition may make us wonder about the use of bells in ensemble performances in ancient times. At the outset of this program, I mentioned that the Six Bell Sackler set was produced about 2,500 years ago, at a time when local Chinese courts were sponsoring orchestras. Pictorial evidence, preserved in the decoration on banqueting vessels of the time, shows performances by groups of late Bronze Age musicians and makes those ancient orchestras come alive. You see here a tracing from one of those vessels, a square wine container that's roughly the same date as the Sackler Bell set. What we seem to see is a concert underway with a group of musicians standing or kneeling and playing a number of different instruments. Four bells suspended near the center of the scene are played by two standing figures caught mid-performance holding mallets in their raised arms. Two other figures, standing to their right, play stone chimes with similar mallets. Filling out the scene are kneeling musicians who play reeds, winds, drums, and other percussion instruments. The active poses of the figure give the performance an animated, almost raucous appearance. Additional evidence on ensemble performance was discovered with the tomb of perhaps the greatest musical patron of the period. A music lover to the very end, the Marquis E of the state of Zhang was buried with the musical instruments of his royal orchestra, which consisted not only of bronze bells, but also zithers, flutes, mouth organs, and more when he died around the year 433 BCE. The most remarkable component of his tomb was his massive set of 65 bells. Earlier in the program, you saw contemporary musicians playing a facsimile based on the Marquis E's set. His assemblage of different bell types covered five octaves and required several musicians to play. Many of the bells bear inscriptions that outline three tuning standards to accommodate the systems used by musicians from different regional states. One for Zhang in Southern China, one for its patron state of Chu, and one for the Royal Zhou Court in the North. Presumably, this allowed his orchestra to play along with visiting musicians from other states traveling with their own instruments. During this period, metallurgists and musicians collaborated to create individual bells capable of producing two pitches that were usually separated by a musical third. Now, I'd like to introduce Hugh Livingston, who will introduce us to his lyrical composition entitled Struck Bronze. Hugh, over to you. Thank you, Keith, for the introduction and for bringing us together again to explore this dynamic project. I want to say what a privilege it has been to work on this artwork, explore the bells, and amplify the musical potential of these instruments thousands of years after they were formed. I had the opportunity to engage with the bells in the Sackler Collection as a result of the Smithsonian Artist Research Fellowship Program, known as SARF, because it's not government without acronyms. SARF gives visual artists the opportunity to engage with any of the thousands of collections and millions and millions of objects that interest them, providing material for future artistic work. Exploring the Bell Collection was an ideal confluence of my interests and the opportunity afforded by the SARF and the Smithsonian's openness. I want to thank everyone at Freer Sackler who welcomed me into an unforgettable experience. To be in the museum every day and learn about the exhibition planning from the inside, to explore library resources related to the archaeology, acoustics, and musicology of ancient Chinese bell culture. And finally, one excellent day to don the white gloves and enter the storage room with Keith to hold the bells in our hands and consider what they would have meant to a civilization thousands of years ago. 
only to hold them, mind you, not to strike them. It was determined by the conservators that they will never be played again, but we were nonetheless able to get a feel for what they were as instruments and objects and what they might have been. I'm going to give you a brief look here at the Silk Thread software that I wrote that uh, controls the animation based on the musical input. And it's in, written in processing, which is a type of JavaScript uh, designed specifically for artists and musicians, uh, visual artists, I meant, and musicians to uh, quickly realize some ideas. So you can see there are lots of variables at the start that give uh, some uh, direction to how the music is interpreted, and then uh, some trigonometry that creates these arcs and uh, the various curves. And then it basically iterates through this as the sound plays from a pre-rendered uh, audio interpretation of the bells. And then it uh, responds uh, on, based on various characteristics. And so we'll take a quick look at uh, the results. So what the software is doing is generating a series of uh, these threads that respond, they're triggered by the uh, arrival of a new musical note, and they're rippled by the overtones. And so they emphasize the way in which the bell has a completely different sound than let's say a flute or a plucked string. And uh, so it's given some visual characteristics. And one of the things that happens is that I can improvise with it a little bit so that it's different every time by dragging the mouse. So if you watch, I think you should see the mouse arrow, you'll see that the line heads towards the mouse arrow if I move it very fast, uh, or I can, when a new series is generated, I can make it move very slowly so the lines stay closer together. And then each new sound is going to ripple the lines in a new way, uh, but I can change the the density that sort of work on the visual composition a little bit uh, differently each time. And so that's how I've created this response to the overtones. And then you'll hear the, also the, the drone tones are reflected in the various colors and so on that emerge. When I first held these bells, representative of such a distant time, I was struck by a story told by their material, shape, and decoration. Some clearly suggest the resonance of a musical device, bells hefty and designed to vibrate. Others appear less crafted or so delicate as to be impractical as instruments of sonic expression. I was interested to put these voiceless bells back into an architectural conversation, but to imply that they remain separate voices, not reunited in the modern era. I've called these bells voiceless partly because they can no longer be played and partly because they only mumble about their past instead of speaking clearly about how they were part of society's sound. But with Keith's scholarship, the recordings made by an acoustician in the 1980s, and three composers set loose on the task, we make them converse again. Each bell tone in my composition is placed into one of eight unique acoustical spaces of different dimensions as, as expressed in a virtual reverberation environment. Gradually, they move from these separate spaces into a final iteration of a source melody heard at the last moment as one coherent breathing line. Alternating piano gestures and bell tones create a sense of opposition, disconnect, and anticipation. Sustained harmonies derived from the decaying bell tones sustain a bridge across time. Gradually, the sounds connect and overarching musical threads become clear. A melody is imagined, beginning in obscurity. At the last moment, the bells assemble in a coherent melodic order. So this is a quick look at the software that makes the audio mix uh, called uh, Logic Pro on the Macintosh. And you can see the difference between the short sounds and the long sustained, I'm calling them stretch, the sustained sounds that have been made from the short bell original strokes. I've time elongated them so that they create some sense of harmony. And I mentioned that there are eight different virtual reverberation spaces. So each of these lines represents a different space in which the sounds exist, and then they're gradually coming together uh, over the full duration of the music, but you'll hear the whole complete mix coming up in a minute. Please enjoy my composition, Struck Bronze, an interactive video animation that I created from the inspiration offered by these bells.
I hope you've enjoyed this opportunity to learn more about ancient Chinese bells and music, to meet some leading American composers, and experience their digital methods of composition. We were able to use their creativity to cross a bridge back in time and think about ways of visualizing sound. I appreciate you taking the time to travel on this wonderful journey with me today. I'm Keith Wilson, and thank you for listening, and thank you for looking. Be well, and see you next time.